coming today in the midst of uh, cold weather. Um, I bring you greetings from Singapore Bible College. Every time I'm asked to speak, I'm supposed to say this because this is part of my job <laughs> description. So Singapore Bible College has four schools, School of Theology in English, School of Theology in Chinese, Mandarin, School of Church Music, and School of Counseling. So we have about 450 students representing 28 countries in the world. And in the School of Counseling, we have 86 right now pursuing a Master's of Arts in Counseling. Our program meets the criteria of Singapore uh, Association for Counseling, which means that after graduation, they are certified to practice professional counseling in the nation of Singapore and in the surrounding areas. So the Singapore Association for Counseling actively vets the School of Counseling at Singapore Bible College. And we've just received a renewal of our certification for the next three years. So within the next two years, if you are around the region, please visit us in Singapore. All right, there's an extra room in our apartment. <laughs> okay, so let me speak to you about unity and love in the body of Christ. The text is going to be taken from Colossians chapter 3, starting from verse 12 until verse 14. Let me introduce this message by sharing a fable. Many of you are familiar with the ace of Greek fables. One of the fables is quite interesting and significant for our reflection today. So in the forest, there lived four oxen. They were very good friends and always went together to graze the fields. However, every time they went together, there was a hungry lion who tried to attack them. The lion longed for the meat of the oxen. But they withstood this attack by fighting together as a team. And so the lion would retreat back because they would be, uh, the lion would be attacked by the horns of these oxen. One day, the story tells that the oxen fought among themselves. And as a result of the infighting, they started to go to the forest separately. It was during this time that the lion returned and he saw the group was divided. He planned to take advantage of this situation Finding the first ox grazing in the fields, he crept from behind and killed the first ox. The next day, he attacked the second ox and killed it too. This is the same manner he killed the third one and also the fourth ox in the field. And so they have lost their lives. The story tells us that there's a moral lesson to this. United we live, divided we will be killed. From which a popular saying has developed. And that popular saying is one that you and I are familiar with. United we stand, divided we fall. And this has been the motto of many organizations, even among nations, they would recite this together. So how do we bring this truth to the community of Christian faith, like the church? I think it's important for God's people to accept the truth that our strength is dependent upon our unity. When we are disunited, we become most vulnerable to the attacks of the evil one who seem to prey upon our weaknesses. But the idea of attaining and sustaining unity in the body of Christ is not something that happens naturally for us. 
You see, we are all a selfish people. By nature, we are selfish. That is why we are commanded specific instructions to obey. And one of them is found in our text today. And so I'd like for us to stand please and read this passage all together. Let's go. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and very beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Be seated, please. Attaining unity in the body of Christ takes intentionality. And by that I mean you and I need to have a sense of purpose. That this is something that we wish to pursue. Unity does not happen overnight. Unity is like a garden. It takes a lot of hard work along with personal sacrifices. But the good news is, unity is attainable, and unity can be sustained. So today I'd like to share with you three ingredients needed for unity to bloom in the body of Christ. And when I go out of this worship service today, I'm going to ask each one of you, what's these three ingredients, including you all young people? So I'd like for you to remember what I have to say today. Are you paying attention? Or are you stealing your Facebook? Turn off the cell phones, put them aside. Alright? And pay attention to what I'm saying. Are you okay now? Andrew? Okay, good. <laughs> Give attention to your neighbors too. Stop looking at the cell phone when the pastor speaks. Okay? Because if you keep on doing that, you are being disrespectful. You'll get mad at what I'm going to say, but the next few days I'm going to be gone, so... <laughs> pastor Vic is going to suffer the consequences. <laughs> but he's very kind, he's not going to say this to you. I'll say it to you, out of love. So put your cell phones away, okay? And listen. The first ingredient in attaining unity in the body of Christ is to develop the virtue within. Within myself. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Take note that the believers in Colossae were addressed as a chosen people. In other words, they were not picked at random to function as disciples. It was part of God's intent for each one to be and to do acts of service. The image that is pictured here is of someone who needs to wear a piece of apparel or garment. This clothing is a protection from all the elements. Interestingly, this clothing is composed of five parts. Compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, and patience. And briefly, I'd like to take a look at each one of them. Compassion. Compassion is the disposition aroused within when one is confronted with those who suffer and are vulnerable. It moves the person to render acts of kindness, to meet the need, to alleviate the suffering. The Greek idea means to show pity, to show mercy, 
to show concern and to be tender-hearted. A person with compassion does not remain neutral when he is exposed to the tears of others. A person of compassion will not stay business as usual when he's confronted by a need. This morning, Pastor Blake mentioned to us a need, a need of winter clothing for those who are coming in from the Philippines. You are going to demonstrate compassion if you do something as an exposure, as a result of your exposure to a need. If you go home and do not do anything, what you are saying is, compassion is not in you. The second is kindness. Kindness is a direct result of compassion. To demonstrate favor, especially to someone who has, who has a need, to actually meet that need as one is empowered to do so. So, as a result of compassion, the person becomes kind. A person who is kind often thinks of others. But his kindness usually stems from the fact that he has been recipient of God's grace. When you and I have been graced of God, we become kind to others. Kindness is quite different from goodness. Goodness refers to the disposition of character. So when we say he is good, we are referring to the personhood. When we say he is kind, we are referring to the act of kindness. The third is humility. The primary idea in humility is to be willing to be brought low, to count others as better than oneself. It stems from being right with God. It leads to the understanding that whatever good happens through this person who is humble is actually a result of a divine act and not due to one's skill or one's competence. You see, to the humble, life is a gift. And to the humble, skill and competence are also gifts. So when a person demonstrates knowledge or skill, if he is humble, it is not to show posturing. In other words, it is not to show to others that he has virtue. One of the ways that you can define pride is to tell others you're humble. Because humility doesn't do posturing. It simply demonstrates an act or a competence, knowing that is a gift from God. The fourth is gentleness. Following the example of Jesus, Paul treats God's people gently. In 1 Thessalonians 2 7, he writes, like a mother caring for her little children. You contrast this to the aggressiveness or the harshness that make little children resist whatever is proposed as lessons to be learned. So gentleness is demonstrated when one withholds judgment of someone who needs correction, knowing fully well that he himself is prone to error. Paul instructs the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 1, that they should restore those who are weak gently. The gentle, you see, does not shoot the wounded, but binds the wounds of the wounded to recovery. So you see, the gentle no longer operates on law, 
the gentle operates on grace. And then the fifth one is patience. Sometimes understood as endurance or perseverance, this virtue does not give up, especially in the face of trouble or affliction. It can be manifested in slowness to events. The person knows that God is sovereign and God will avenge him. He doesn't have to take matters into his own hands. Sometimes rendered as long suffering, the patient individual is one who is willing to travel yet another mile with you. He is not quick tempered or easily irritated. And the virtue is anchored upon a solid belief that God is in complete control. He is sovereign. All these five virtues reside within the individual. That is why I mentioned to develop virtue within. Collectively, they are foundational for unity in the body of Christ. Without these virtues, unity will weaken and eventually unity in the community will crumble. The second ingredient is to develop virtue towards others. So now we know the virtues within. We look at the virtue towards others. Verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Interpersonal disunity is one of the common issues that Christian counselors encounter. One primary cause of conflict in human relationship is lack of skill in relating with others, especially with those who are different from us. Just a few weeks ago, I attended a conference sponsored by seven seminaries in Singapore about theological education in Singapore and in surrounding areas. One of the speakers reported this. He said that there was a survey that was done for a period of four years among missionary agencies all over the world. And they have found out that there is about an 8% retention problem among missionaries every year. He has given us figures. What this means actually is that there are about 80,000 missionaries who are quitting every four years. And one very important reason that the speaker mentioned is because they said these missionaries do not know how to relate with others who are different from them. I have seen American missionaries return to the United States heartbroken because of so much unresolved conflict in the mission areas where they were asked to serve. See, the traditional missionary posture is, oh, we know the problem of the Filipinos. We know the problem of Indonesians. We are going to go there, give them the solution, they will listen to us. Well, this approach was resisted. And now missionary agencies are changing their paradigms. What there is, the, the belief system now is something like this. We will go to the country in Asia, we will listen to the people, and ask them to tell us what is going on with them, and then we're going to align our lives with them. Quite a different posture from the previous one. And so we learn from hard realities and experiences. I'd like to share with you two skills needed if we want to promote relational harmony or relational unity in the community 
of God. First, the skill of forbearing, and the second, the skill of forgiving. Forbearing. It means we are to be patient and tolerant of another person's flaw or weakness. By the way, this means we should not change the other person. This means we are to be tolerant of the person's flaw. I'm not talking about tolerant of sin. I'm talking about tolerant in terms of the person's weakness or fault. And how do you do this? You need to make two commitments. Your first commitment is to commit to not easily get hurt. Hypersensitivity reveals lack of emotional stability. This commitment suggests you do not personalize every comment of another person that you hear and go home and look at the mirror and say, Poor little me. You commit to not easily get hurt. The other thing that you need to commit is to not easily find fault. Fault finding reveals personal rigidity and could result into legalism. When I'm rigid to myself, I become legalistic towards others. People come to relationships to be accepted and to be understood. That's our primary need, all of us. All of us need to be accepted and to be understood. If the relationship highlights their fault all the time, they are not going to be sustained in that relationship. Both oversensitivity and rigid legalism are symptoms of spiritual infancy and emotional immaturity. Both issues have to be addressed for change to occur. And the initial part of change is to admit the need for change. This includes admitting that there are symptoms that are demonstrating a need for change. We cannot change if we do not see the need for change. If the need for change is not addressed, it will strongly block one's capacity to start and to nurture unity in relationships. So the Apostle Paul says, be forbearing of one another. And then he says, be forgiving of each other. That's the second skill. Forgiving is part of our capacity to be gracious to ourselves, even as we are gracious to others. It is to decide no longer to hold on to whatever grievance we experience. If you have a grievance towards somebody who did something that you didn't like, Forgiveness is no longer to hold on to that. How do you do that? You have to make two commitments. There are two commitments in forbearing. There are two commitments in forgiving. The first is to commit not to hurt anymore. Hurt as an emotion usually follows the thought that one has been victimized. Part of the commitment is to decide that one has hurt enough already and deserves to be free from the pain. There is a time to cry, there is a time to wipe the tears. So the first commitment is, I am not going to hurt anymore. Do you realize that that is a choice? So I am shifting some of your structures here in your brain right now. It's a choice to not hurt anymore. The other choice that you need to commit is to not empower the offender anymore. The more you get hurt, the more you empower the one who offends you. Does he deserve the power? Your answer is no. Only God deserves power over your heart. Part of forgiving is to transfer what psychologists call locus of control. Alright? Regarding the hurt 
away from the offender. So the offender has hurt you, that behavior has controlled you, your heart has to transfer that control to someone or to somewhere. And since, since we're speaking the language of faith, we transfer that control to the cross. So you say, I am not going to hurt anymore, I have hurt enough, I am going to release the offense to the cross. By the way, in case you do not know it yet, the cross can do a better job. As far as the offender is concerned. Because someone will ask, Pastor Ralph, does that mean that the person will no longer be accountable? Of course not. The person will still be accountable for his offense, but he's not accountable to you anymore. Is accountable to the cross. You you can begin enjoying your life. Yeah, because that person is enjoying his life. And how about you? You're still grieving. Oh, 10 years ago, he is not giving me the Christmas card. <laughs> Two years ago, he forgot my birthday. <laughs> Release the offense. Okay? So here in is a very strong challenge for us. The Apostle Paul adds to his teaching this manner of forgiving. He says, as the Lord has forgiven you. This means that the forgiving person has also been forgiven. That's why he can be forgiving. Herein lies a common problem of all human beings, including some of us here in this community. We often want to be forgiven by the Lord, but we are prone to refuse to be forgiven as the Lord. <clears throat> you want me to repeat that? We often want to be forgiven by the Lord, but we are prone to refuse to be forgiving as the Lord. I've studied these two words quite some time, and I have found the dynamic of offense is common in forbearing and forgiving. Forbearing suggests not taking the offense easily. This is possible because the individual is tolerant of another's flaw. Forgiving suggests the offense is released promptly. This is possible because the individual decided no longer to carry the load. The appropriate release point of the offense is the foot of the cross, for that is where it belongs. The choice of not taking offense easily and of releasing the offense promptly suggests that both virtues have to be intentional on the part of the disciple. It is not natural for us to do this. That's why we have to be intentional. But let me share good news for you. Obedience is not natural. It's not natural for us to come here at 9 o'clock in the morning. What's natural is for another hour of sleep. It's not natural for us to study the Word of God. What's natural is to look at Facebook. So many of the things that we look for in the scriptures are not natural. Therefore, we need to be intentional. We need to be purposeful. In forbearing, because one does not get hurt easily, conflict does not occur readily. Because the person is tolerant of another's flaw, conflict is prevented. Because one does not take offense easily, conflict does not take root. In forgiving, because one decides to hurt no more, broken relationships can be restored promptly. Because, because one carries the, Lord, the load no more, conflict is redeemed. Because one releases the offense promptly, conflict does not bear fruit. In forbearing, conflict does not take root. In forgiving, Conflict does not bear fruit. Now we understand why the Apostle Paul brings these two together in one verse. When forbearing and forgiving are fully operational at all levels of relationships among disciples, family, friendship, 
church fellowship, two outcomes results to this, namely, considerable amount of interpersonal conflict is either avoided or redeemed. And the second one is the witness of the gospel becomes clear and attractive among observers. I propose to you, there is an urgent call for the body of Christ to demonstrate the dual virtues of forbearance and forgiveness today. <coughs> Both of these immensely contribute to relational harmony and sustained unity. That's the virtue towards others. And because I'm a Baptist, the third point, the virtue, to develop the virtue that binds. These are all in passage. So develop the virtues within, develop, develop the virtues towards others, and now we develop the virtue that binds. Look at verse 14. And over all these put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is a relational term. Whenever you and I think of love, by necessity, we think about relationships. Paul's use of relational terms supports his view. Look at the use of the phrase one another in verse 10. Then look at the use of with in verse 13, verse 15, verse 16, verse 18 of the same chapter. Share with, rejoice with, mourn with, live in harmony with, and live at peace with. I cannot show brotherly devotion to myself. I cannot rejoice with myself. I cannot mourn with myself. When all of my energy is focused simply on me, I, myself, and me, I will probably have a diagnosable personality disorder called narcissism. Sharing connotes relationship. Rejoicing with someone or mourning with someone suggests empathy with another human being. Living in harmony suggests that there is more than one person involved. So we have heard a lot of singing today. Thank you, uh, team, for doing that. If you are singing by yourself, it is called what? Solo. If you sing with someone who voices out a different note, but complements to what you are singing, you are doing harmony. There is no color harmony if there is only one color. Neither there is musical harmony if there is only one note. In life, there will be no experience of true love if one lives by himself and not in community with others. So how do we develop the virtue of love? We need to understand again that to love is a choice. So, we start to love by appropriating the love of God for us because by ourselves we do not know how to love. That's why we have to receive the love of God. 1 John 4.19 reads, We love because He first loved us. We grow in love by actually demonstrating love in relationships. The primary evidence that we have the love of God is, is when we keep His commands according to John 14 verse 15. The commands of God can actually be summarized in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. To love God with all of ourselves, to love, to love God with all ourselves, to love self and then to love others. When we have the love of God flowing through us, we have what it takes to bind us together in perfect <coughs> unity. So many of you here like to bake. There is an ingredient that unites all of them together. So for seven years now, my wife and I have been on a gluten-free diet. And we have found out that there is an ingredient that binds it all together. Some of you are familiar with Santan gum. 
if you put santan gum, it binds all of the ingredients together. The original binding is taken from wheat, but we do not want to eat wheat anymore. Because we, I have a severe reaction, allergic reaction towards wheat. So now we have found a perfect binding agent called Santa gum. When we have a binding agent, because all of us are different ingredients, just look at your sizes. <laughs> We're not talking about gender differences yet. And we're not talking about racial or provincial differences here. We have all different ingredients. We need to have a binding unity, the binding agent to unite us. And that is the virtue of love. It unites all believers, even as members of the body of Christ. We share a common purpose, and that is to please our God. Romans 15, verse 5, all praise for unity. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ. The term spirit of unity tells us that the experience of unity is essentially spiritual in nature. Compare this with uniformity, which is often based on something external or something material. The theme is so significant that the, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself prayed specifically for His followers to be united. So in John chapter 17, verse 11, it reads, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Do you know that the evil one is working doubly hard to isolate believers from one another? Do you know that the evil one is working very, very hard to provide for us distraction so that we will be separated from one another? That is his primary modus operandi. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ had to pray for the followers to be united because our strength is in our unity. We are not going to be a powerful community of people if we are disunited. God wants us to remain faithful to Him. When we are faithfully obedient, unity becomes our experience. So let me conclude by saying, take note. All of these virtues are commanded in our texts. Put on the clothes of compassion. Do you remember the five? Yes. Be forbearing of one another and be forgiving of each other. And put on the love that binds. They are all structured in what we call a command form. Remember your English grammar, imperative form. It's not a request. It's not, Brother Manny, Sister Tess, can you please be united? It's not like that. We are commanded directly. It's here. It's an imperative form. The command reminds us that there's nothing natural about obedience. Left unto ourselves, the best of us would rather fall back on the level of personal comfort and disobey. We will only obey whenever it is convenient for us to obey. Obedience is closely linked with love. I mentioned John 14 verse 15 already. If you love me, keep my commands. In other words, if you love me, obey. In verse 23 to 24 of John 14, Jesus continues, Anyone who loves me will obey my commands, my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not 
love me will not obey my teaching. It is not rocket science. It is not complicated. If you are obedient, you are loving God. If you are disobedient, you are not loving God. It is not complicated. Let's not fool ourselves when we say we love Him, but we do not obey Him. Sino ni loko mo? Says the Tagalog. I don't know about the Ilongo or Ilongo. Sino kin tonto mo? Love na love ka, wala ka naman ubi. Yan, may Ilongo ka naman ito. How do you say it in Ilongo? Okay. If you love me, you obey my teaching. Ultimately, the challenge about unity in the body of Christ is a challenge of obedience. It is an obedience issue that comes from love. Unity, obedience, love. So love is the source. It results into unity, but it has to be mediated by obedience. Whenever there is disarray, there is disobedience. Wherever there is harmony, there is obedience. So my challenge to you today is, will you be a channel of disarray? Or will you be a channel of harmony? It's your choice. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you for reminding us of your word. That unity is a very, very important ingredient of why we become strong as a community. My prayer is that each one of us, young and old, woman or man, becomes a channel of unity. How do we do this? By loving you. And how do we demonstrate our love for you? By your name. Thank you for making this clear to us today. And thank you for granting us grace. Because we are right on Lord. There is nothing natural about the way. We have to be intentional. We have to make sacrifices. But when we look at what you have done at the cross, the ultimate sacrifice by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, our sacrifice is really nothing in comparison. So help us to do this joyfully. For this is my prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for His sake. Amen. 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 Shalom, everyone.